This conference is now being recorded. Good afternoon. Welcome to the New York State ASO webinar, Food Service Operations. My name is Matthew Darius. I'm the Senior Staff Associate for Professional Development here at ASBO, and I'll be moderating today's call. Your presenter today is from the Chittenango School District. Uh, her name is Wendy Swift. She'll be speaking today on food service. If you have questions at any time for Wendy, please hit 7 pound on your phone. Again, that's 7 pound. Then I'll notify me you have a question, and then I'll break in, and uh, you'll be able to talk to Wendy um, right over the phone. You can send chat questions at any time using the chat pane to your right. And if you have questions at any time on uh, you know, something not working properly with the webinar, hit zero pounds and I'll take you to an operator through the webinar company, Confertel. And without further ado, Wendy, it's all yours. Hi, how are you, is everybody? Um, please bear with me. This is my first webinar, so hopefully we'll get through this fine. Uh, just a little background about myself. I have roughly 18 years of experience in school food service, and I am currently the food service director for eight school districts in the area. I am a BOCES employee um, and do travel to the districts um, to oversee the day-to-day -day operations. So with that, um, I guess I'll talk a little bit about the child nutrition program in general, and hopefully you'll have lots of questions for me. Um, there's a lot of paperwork, as you would know, working with state ed uh, involving the school lunch program. Every year we must go online, um, update our, our inf school information, and do an annual renewal. Uh, this lets state ed know what programs we're planning to offer, um, what grades we'll be feeding, will we be feeding breakfast and lunch, will we have a snack program. So this is very handy for them to track and monitor what paperwork we need to be turning in during the school year. Um, the next part of the puzzle that we have to do right as school starts is the um, free and reduced applications, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. Um, we have a number of applications that come in early in the school year, and it is our job to make sure that these applications are processed correctly. And in doing so, we must announce to the public that we have uh, this free and reduced lunch program. So every year we must send out a public announcement uh, at no charge. Um, it, if the paper chooses to put it in, um, it, it will be at no cost to us. We must also fill out a certificate of acceptance, letting state ed know who will be your hearing official if you have any issues with your frame reduced program, who will be processing your applications, and who will be uh, in charge of the verification process, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, we, it is required that you use new applications every single school year. We are not allowed to use last year's applications. Um, the applications that we have on file from last year, we are allowed to use through September 30th of the next school year. However, if you have stacks and stacks of printed applications from, say, 2009-10, you are not allowed to use those, and you will be cited by state ed if they come and do a CRE review in your district, if they find a lot of outdated applications. Um, after we process applications, we need to notify parents of how they qualified, oh, I'm way behind on my slides here, um, and this is very important. It lets the parent know if they should be free, reduced, or, or if they were denied. Um, this gives the parent, if they were denied or reduced, a chance to ask questions of why they didn't qualify, um, maybe we missed something. So it's, it's a good check for both of us to make sure that all the information was entered correctly and that they're receiving the benefits that they are really due. Um, there are a number of ways to determine eligibility for frame reduced applications. The biggest and, and most popular form would be um, income eligible applications, meaning that, that households turn in information um, from pay stubs, from tax returns, and we process these applications based on that information. Probably the newest um, process is this electronic match of direct certification. That started this August and is really helpful for finding stray um, families that 
may or may not have, have filled out an application. What this basically is, is um, we take all of the zip codes in the school district, we enter them into um, a website that, that lets us know if these families, any family in the district is receiving food stamps. Um, and then it, it matches our student database with their database, letting us know if these, if these children re receive food stamps. If they do, we can automatically make these children free without having to have them fill out an application or without the parent having to send in a direct certification letter from the state. This speeds up the process, and I really do believe it, it helps us capture um, a number of families that we might have missed. Um, and of course, we have the homeless migrant and runaway program and foster program. These these children are all categorically free, um, no questions asked, kind of a thing. Um, and again, income applications are the most uh, prevalent. We do have applications that we can offer to families in foreign languages, if need be. Um, but we do need to have the parents list what type of income they have. Is it weekly, biweekly? Um, it must be signed. We must have the last four digits of a social security number. That is new. Uh, it used to be the whole social security number. And um, once these applications are, com are completed, um, the, the children will start receiving benefits right away. Um, we, most school districts use POS software, which is point of sale software, and this helps um, with the process of applications. This spreadsheet that you see in front of you is a scale letting us know how families will qualify. This is automatically put into our point of sale systems. This um, determines whether a family is free or reduced or does not qualify based on the number of, of family members. Um, and it, this does change each year. This is provided by State Ed for our, our use. And again, it's programmed in each year to our systems. Um, any applications we receive with food stamps or TANF number, uh, the system automatically makes them free. Foster children are automatically free also. Um, this is the direct line certification that we just talked about that categorically will make anybody with food stamps in your school district free. Um, again, new this year, um, it is, well, let's go back, it is mandatory to have this done in August, November, and February, so most of the school districts are just now starting the second phase of this process. Um, direct certification letters, we must send home a letter with the direct certification process. This means that after we've made all of those stray um, families that we may not have caught through an application free, we do have to send a letter home saying, we've automatically made you free. Do you want these benefits? And in all of my eight districts, I think I've received one letter where somebody did not want the benefits. Um, State Ed is doing more and more to try and help these families receive benefits, and it's, it's beneficial both to the food service program and, of course, to the school district. When it comes to filling out BEDS numbers, um, you want to have the highest rates that you can you can possibly get. Um, and again, you know, even capturing homeless and migrant runaway um, applications. We are seeing more and more of these. Um, it, so it's something for the principals to really kind of keep in contact with the food service directors about. Uh, if they know that there's a, a, a family that's maybe living in a hotel, um, get in contact with us, let us see what we can do about helping to fill out an application for those families. Um, there, are in, there are applications where we are allowed to make a family free for 45 days while we're trying to um, receive the information on an application. For instance, if they didn't put an income down, um, we can work with the family to try to get that information, but in the meantime, we can make them free. Um, applications should be kept on file for three years plus the current year. They should be retrievable by building. That does not mean you have to keep the applications in each building. They just want to, State Ed wants to have them separated so at any time if they happen to walk into a building. Um, they can have a booklet that has all of the free and reduced students just for that building. 
makes it easier actually on all of us. Um, we do keep master lists of free and reduced students. Um, this confidential information, this is really becoming a hot button issue. Years ago, somebody would call up and ask for uh, a free and reduced information. And years ago, we used to give that out. Um, it is becoming harder and harder for administrators to obtain this list from the Food Service Office, and it's not because we're being nasty. Um, they're really cracking down on giving this information out. Um, more and more school districts are being sued over confidentiality issues. So we tend to not let just anybody have this list anymore. Um, primarily, the only reason really is to uh, is for grant information, and even then, it's usually just numbers and not names. However, um, State Ed does provide a form letter, which you can change to your liking, um, allowing parents to sign off on the fact that their information can be shared with others. This is a good route for some districts if they, they want to use the free and reduced information to help pay for testing or art supplies. So that may be something you want to talk to your food service director about is having that letter sent out. <clears throat> Wendy, we have a question from Shelly sure, McKees. Sure. Uh, her question is, is anyone else having trouble logging on to do their direct certifications? Yes. <laughs> it is, it, because it's such a new process, um, it, it is not easy. It's very time consuming. I don't know if you happen to use a point of sale system, but I do know NutriKids just wrote a script that if we program um, the zip codes in, it will do the search for us saving us a lot of time. I do know in August with eight school districts, we were doing it by hand. Um, so it's not a very good process at this point. We've all been complaining to state ed. We've been complaining to the food stamp office. Um, and hopefully it'll get better. But yes, it's not a very good process right now. Did that answer that at all? Um, back to Ms. to issues on free and reduced applications. Um, we do have a, re a CRE review, which is basically a state coming in and monitoring our free and reduced applications. Years ago, this was done every five years. Uh, they're narrowing that down to a three-year process. Um, I, I don't know if it's because they were finding too many mistakes or um, you know, because these applications are getting more more um, complicated and this information is becoming um, more important for funding, uh, they've decided to, to really monitor these applications every three years. Um, but they do look over to make sure that they're processed correctly, um, that we're not giving reduced benefits to a family that really deserves free benefits. Um, you can see in here the misuse of administrative prerogative. This happens a lot in districts where a principal will be insistent that a family deserves free just because they feel that time is hard for them. Um, but I really try to shy away from any applications from administrators. I try to get some kind of documentation behind it because um, we can get in trouble for having any of those or too many of those on file. Um, again, we do have applications that are um, in other languages if need be. Tomorrow is November 15th, which means we've, we will finalize, actually let's go back to this, our income verification process. And um, I won't go into that in too much detail. We'll skip through a lot of these slides. But income verification is the process of picking 3% of your total applications on file on October 1st. and um, say it's six, six applications, you must verify that that information on that application is true. What that means is that we have to contact the family. We need to receive pay stubs. We need a tax return um, or something of that short sort to show what the inform that the information they provided to us is correct. And typically what I find is that a lot of parents will put net income on an application and not gross income, and a lot of the times that will bump that person to the next um, um, next level of benefits. So if they were free, they actually get bumped to reduced. If they were reduced, they actually um, 
are removed from the program. Um, so we have to do this every year, um, and it is mandatory that the families that do not comply are removed from the system on November 15th. So tomorrow's a big day for your food service directors. They have to make sure everybody's off the program. Um, we must then fill out the at, uh, what they call the attachment G form and send that to the state, letting them know how our um, process went. If we if we process six applications, do we get six responses? Of those six responses, um, who was who stayed free, who remained reduced, and so on. It's a, a detailed form we have to fill out for them, um, and that's due actually December fifteenth. Um, we don't have to do verification for paid students special milk programs, or any resi residency, day hall, um, children, or child care um, facilities. Um, this, I won't bore you with details, but this kind of breaks out the error prone method versus um, alternate methods, which most of us use an error prone method, meaning that less than 80% of the families complied and responded to our verification process. I do think the state is slowly trying to weed out those people that have learned this system and are trying to use it, um, but that's taking some time. So again, it started October 1st. We close on November 15th, and we have to have our paperwork into the state by December 15th. Um, we don't include homeless or migrant workers in this verification process, and we don't include direct certification um, students that would be the students that where we either have made them direct cert ourselves or we get a letter from the state saying that they're eligible for free meals. Um, again, you choose 3%. We're always rounding up, so if, if it says 5.15 applications, you're going to round up and pick six applications. Um, we'll skip through a couple of these. These are examples if you really want to look at verification process for next year. Um, Again, the person that, that puts all the applications into the system or qualifies everybody for free and reduce cannot be your verification official. So you actually need somebody else working with you. If you have a smaller school district and you, you just have a food service manager, they really need to enlist the help of somebody in, say, the district office or the business office, and they need to um, have them be the person that will be in contact with families. Um, you cannot be both your reviewing official and your verification official. Um, you also have your hearing official, which is usually your business official. Um, in case a parent calls to complain, they will usually step in and help. Um, this is just a little brief information that basically we if you pull an application that's a fragile household, you know the family, you know the situation, you know it's not a good thing. Um, it, we don't have to verify that application. We can pass over that application and, and find another application to verify. And with most of these computerized point of sale systems, most of this is done for you. Um, it will help fill out your attachment G form. It will help you select error-prone applications, which are applications that are kind of right on the border of being free or paid or reduced. Um, if you're doing this by hand, it actually is a lot more work. Uh, but there still are some school districts out there doing that, and it works for them. Um, just more information about who or families can call if they need help. You must have a toll-free number on your uh, form if they need help. Um, this verify for cause that is down at the bottom is if we find an application that um, seems really shady and we know that these people are living in a mansion and um, we have an application saying that they're free, we can verify an application for cause, and we usually do do that during, during the verification process. Um, we must keep all this paperwork again on file, and uh, for I imagine most things for the state, it's three years plus the current year. Um, if you do not have any luck with verification at all, you need to go to your business official, at least that's what I do, um, and see if they can help get some response from the verification process. 
Um, and again, pay stubs are very important in this process. Um, any kind of, of it, for example, it says here, you know, a letter from the pastor. We can take just about anything to get this verification process closed. Um, but as I said, that ends tomorrow. And there's a detailed schedule of everything that uh, needs to be turned in or pulled for verification. So that's a handy document to have as a business official if you want to hold on to that, um, just to make sure your food service director's kind of adequately running the process. Um, let's move on to direct verification. Um, a lot like um, verification in general. Um, it, it, it's basically just letting families know how they qualify. It's, it's, it's very similar to what we had been doing um, and it, following the same rules as verification. Um, let's skip over this because it's basically what we've talked about. Um, Examples of collection methods. Okay. Um, we were talking about a computerized point of sale system. Uh, I do think most schools are using a computerized point of sale system. Um, some schools still use rosters and some schools <laughs> use tick sheets or tickets. I'm, I actually still have a school that uses tickets. And basically, this, these are examples of collection methods. What they're talking about with collection methods now is after we've gotten to know um, who's free and reduced. Um, it is important that at, when a child steps up to the register, they're being claimed as free, reduced, or paid, and it needs to be accurate. So your collection method is very important, and you must make sure it is accurate. Um, the other key piece of this is to make sure that um, if Bobby comes through the serving line and Susie's standing right behind him, that she can't tell if Bobby is free or reduced or paid. Um, so that is one of the huge benefits of, of a point of sale system. Um, a majority of the kids under this system pr prepay for meals, so they don't know if the child's not handing money over because he has money on his account or, um, you know, if because he's free. Um, they they also do these systems also do nightly backups, which is very handy where rosters can get lost um, and can be problematic. Um, and I have found over the years, as we talk a little more about finances down the road, that um, really to run a, a profitable food service program, um, the, the point of sale system is the best way to go. I, I As I've taken over small districts in the area um, and moved them into the point of sale process, I found that we were losing hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars a year from students that owed us money from charges or um, as we took in prepayments, it might have been $5. Well, they got confused as to how many meals the child had left, so they just gave them five more meals for the week because they weren't quite sure how many meals the, the child had as they were converting to the next week. So financially, it makes very sound sense to um, purchase a point-of-sale system. They are a big expense initially, but I do think they pay for themselves down the road. Um, again, tickets are another method. Um, they need to be coded so nobody can tell who's who in terms of free, reduced, or paid. Um, you cannot put free students on one roster, reduced students on another roster, and paid students on your third roster. They need to be intermixed. It needs to be either by classroom or alphabetical. Um, you can't treat free and reduced students any differently. Um, and of course, the biggest par part of of, you know, our job is to feed the, the students and feed them a healthy meal, but is to, um, when it comes to the financial side, we our biggest um, key is to make sure that we are accurately claiming meals for reimbursement, because uh, that's really where we make our money is from the reimbursement that we turn in at the end of each month. Um, again, your point of sale is, you know, um, very important to you when you're when Talking about a point of sale or a cash register at the end of a serving line, it is very important for accuracy to make sure that your cashiers know what a complete meal is. Um, and a complete meal is any meal that meets the requirements of a reimbursable meal. Um, and depending on 
in your your food structure, what what meal system you have chosen. Are you traditional? Are you enhanced traditional? How many components do you have? Um, that will let your cashiers know what a complete meal is. For years, most of us used a traditional meal pattern, um, having five components, and a student had to have three components on the tray. Now, a component can actually be comprised of two things. So a hamburger, for example, would be your bread component and your meat component. So the only other item that student would need on a tray is either a milk, a fruit, a vegetable, and that would be considered a complete meal. Um, these days, the structures are changing. I have now upped our meals to six components per, um, per day, so a child must take four, and that's to help us meet the nutritional requirements, um, vitamins, calories, that type thing. Um, so it's a little bit harder for state ed to monitor these complete meals, but they still do come out and check to make sure that we are um, meeting all the right components. If you ring up a meal that is not complete, we shouldn't really be claiming that meal as reimbursable. Um, adult meals in a la carte snacks cannot be claimed as reimbursable, and we cannot count any second meals as reimbursable meals. You should never have sold more meals per day than you have kids in the building. Um, and with that being said, usually most, most of these schools in New York State right now are averaging around, I think, Last time I looked, the number was about 58% participation in any school district on any given day. Um, you'll find some that are higher than that. But you do want to kind of check your math once in a while and make sure that your cashiers aren't overclaiming meals by accident or, you know, for whatever reason. Um, and again, those point-of-sale systems do help with that. Um, they will stop you after one reimbursable meal. They will say, stop, you've already done this for today. <coughs> So that's a big help to uh, the cashiers. Um, these are just other types of meal service that is available. Um, I will tell you not too many school districts do um, family style or buffet style. Uh, you might find a salad bar here and there that's similar to buffet style, but it is very hard for the cashiers and the students, especially in a salad bar situation, to really understand what they have on their tray and what components they're taking. Um, so it, it does make it challenging for ringing up reimbursable meals. Um, you may find head or family style in a lot of your Head Start programs if you have Head Start in um, your school buildings. But we do not claim Head Start meals as reimbursable. We just charge them for the meals. Um, bagged lunches and picnics, two of my least favorite things. They are very hard for us to claim meals. Um, bagged lunches really need to be um, take, or handed to the student, and that whoever that um, adult might be handing that meal to that student, whether it be a teacher, um, a, a family member if they're out on some kind of a field trip, or um, a, a school lunch lady, um, you really need to check that child's name off on a roster as you're giving that child a meal. It should not be checked off at 8 a.m. when he took the meal, and um, you're not even sure if he consumed it You know, three hours later or where it went. Picnics are also a little complicated. Um, again, I would suggest a roster process if you are feeding outside of the school building. Um, and make sure that all of the components are there. Um, I, and then you can actually go back and bulk enter some of that information into some of the software programs. Um, so it does help a little. Um, Pre-counting and attendance counts. Some, some school districts way back in the 80s were just marking off that they fed every kid in the building except for the kids that were absent that day. So I think they've gotten a little bit stricter about monitoring um, how many meals you're feeding. On average, you're not allowed to just do a head count because you don't know if they're free or reduced or paid. Um, again, you can't claim second meals or a la carte meals. Um, and you can't prepay for lunches and just assume that kid is going to eat for five days. That kid, you, you can put the money on the kid's account, but he actually needs to be charged for a lunch on the day that he is coming across that register. Um, 
you talked briefly about menu planning options. Um, most school districts are, are moving towards traditional or enhanced traditional. The nutrient standard menu planning option is becoming obsolete. Um, State Ed is changing a lot of our processes. Uh, this started back in, in hmm, maybe February or March of last year. And um, they are trying to make things more uniform across the state and uh, m make it simpler for us to know what patterns we need to be offering to these children. So traditional enhanced are very similar. Uh, and it's basically just, again, breaking it down to components. How many meat servings do we have to have per day? How many... Um, bread components, how much, you know, how much specific amount of food for each age group do we need? So it, it, it's a very basic system, easy to understand, but we must have meat or meat alternates. Um, by alternates, we mean some other kind of protein source. You have to have your breads and grains, and you must have fruits and vegetables, and you must always offer milk. Um, and there are very specific age groups within these patterns through a lot of this. Um, enhanced, very similar in age groups that, that change slightly. Um, and this just breaks out into more detail. If you ever want to look at your menu and see what's being served, this breaks out into more detail um, what we have to have on each tray. So I'm allowed to tweak this. For example, this says two, two servings of fruits and vegetables totaling three quarter cups a day. Um, I found it easier in the kitchens for the cafeteria staff to just offer two half cup servings, a little more than we need, but it, it helps with our calorie count. At least we're offering fruit or vegetable, um, healthy product. A lot of my schools, I now allow the students to portion out product for themselves. So you will find some kids may take actually a full cup of fruit or vegetable, but then you'll get a couple of students that may only take a quarter cup. So it does wash in the end, and every little ex you know every every extra um, fruit or vegetable those kids take it really helps us meet our nutritional requirements for our SMI review. Um, this again is just breaking out portion sizes. What is a meat? Um, meat alternate, how many grains per week, uh, and there are ways to, to work this to our benefit. For example, um, if you're looking at the bread grains here, it, we have to offer 15 servings of bread per week, and the way for me to always make sure I am meeting that bread component without ever having to give it a second thought is I make I have all of the kitchens make peanut butter and jelly as triple deckers. So there are three slices of bread in that peanut butter and jelly. I offer it five times a week. That meets my 15 bread component uh, per week. I am covered. I will never be written up for not having enough breads per week. So there are ways once you get used to these systems to find little ways to tweak them um, so you won't ever get in charge. Um, again, these are just other versions of alternate um, meat products that we can offer. I'm sure most of you are seeing more and more vegetarians in your districts, so we are always looking for alternate protein sources that the students will eat. Um, they have to have some form of protein offered to them. Um, and again, things that don't count as a meat alternate, um, just some basic nutritional stuff that we all have to follow. I should say that what one of the things becoming more and more common um, and I think that Matthew may have added a second packet to your information that he sent out. Um, I, I have a little background, um, or a little, yeah, brief background in food allergies and food intolerances that I included. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges today in the food service program is that you are finding a, a huge portion of our kids are coming in with food allergies, um, and you're seeing more and more districts hiring part-time dietitians to help us wade through these issues. Um, you know, again, with 18 years of health care, or 18 years of food service experience, prior to that I worked in hospitals, and I still get very nervous around children with food allergies because uh, I don't want to make anybody sick. 
it, it takes a lot of education. It takes a lot of educating of your staff. You really need to have some kind of policies in place um, with your nursing staff so you know how to handle kids that are highly allergic to peanut butter, um, you know, gluten intolerant. And it, it becomes a very important issue because with, with it ever increasing, we are having to bear the cost of that, um, of these issues. For example, if a student is lactose intolerant and needs to have lactate, it is the responsibility of the food service program to buy that product uh, if they have a doctor's note. So the, you know, gluten allergies, you know how expensive gluten products are in the grocery store. It is really our responsibility to provide the students a reimbursable meal using the product that they need if they have doctor's notes on file. So um, it's becoming quite a burden for the districts um, in terms of cost. So hopefully these these allergy products will slowly come down, but the dietitian, dietitians do make it very helpful. Um, they can write specific meal patterns for the students and help us save a little bit of money. Um, again, going back to requirements for school lunch, um, again, milk has to be offered every day. Um, we will skip through. Breakfast is very similar to lunch. Uh, a lot of the same components, just a smaller amount of them. Um, and the strange thing is that we are we are monitored now every three years on our nutritional integrity of our menus, but that is only for lunch. They do not do a nutritional analysis of the breakfast program. I imagine that will come about at some point. Um, but as of yet, we do not have to provide them with information for breakfast. Um, oops, maybe flying through some of these too much. Um, but these are some of the things that we look at when analyzing a nutritional, um, the nutritional integrity of a menu. Um, and these are what the state will look at when they are analyzing our meals also. Calories, of course, are huge, um, must meet all our calorie requirements. They also look at things like calcium, iron, vitamin A, vitamin C. And of course, for he years you've been hearing that uh, our fat is not to exceed 30%. And saturated fat has to be under 10%. We now are not allowed to have any trans fats also. Um, they check fiber, sodium. Now, this slide says 1,200 milligrams of sodium. Um, they're in the process of changing that. And I've heard a number of different numbers, but until I actually see it in writing, um, I won't quite know. But they're throwing out the number of 700 milligrams of sodium. And that is a lot less than actually a lot of cardiac doctors will suggest for patients in the hospital. So it's going to be a huge challenge for us. We are working with manufacturers to try to change product, try to find things that are acceptable for students. Um, most school districts have taken salt shakers out of the cafeteria. If you haven't, you really need to to start getting these kids ready to um, you know, face these lower sodium meals. Um, it's, it's, and it's going to be a big challenge. Um, but one of the proposals out there is that if we're meeting all of these requirements, if we're doing good on our CREES, if we meet our SMI, which is our, our um, nutritional review, if we meet the requirements, they're talking about giving us an extra six cents in reimbursement per meal. And that can be a huge windfall for um, you know some of these districts that have very high frame reduced percentages. Um, so, again, you know, all the school districts are trying to work on cutting sodium out. Um, kids aren't too happy about it, and it's one of those deals where you don't want to push the kids away because they're not liking the food. So what do you do? A, a difficult task. Um, we'll skip through the NSMP menu planning because they're getting rid of that um, probably as of next year. Um, Offer versus serve. Offer versus serve has been in New York State for quite some time. And basically, this is really saying that the student has the right to do what they want to do. Um, the student has the right to pick their meal. Um, there are school districts that have prepackaged meals. I, I, I have a couple myself where we, we ship out to one small site that may only have 20 or 30 kids in a bu building. Um, 
those are prepackaged meals, so they don't really have the right to have offer versus serve. We do try to package sides separately so they can make some choices. But it is important to let a kid be accountable for what they want to eat. It really does reduce food waste um, and is really mandatory at the high school level. These kids need to take ownership for what they want to be eating. Um, and I, I think you will find offer versus serve. I think we kind of preach it through the middle school and often into the elementary school. Um, I think primarily it's only the kindergarten teachers that are really forceful about these kids taking everything on their plate. Um, you know, again, we have to offer entrees. Um, the kids do have some choices. If, if you're offering the five items per day, they're allowed to decline two items. Um, and the key to success with all of these different choices and sides is to keep pretty standardized in what you offer. Uh, so the kids know that on, you know, if our, our menu always has five items, say. They know they need to take three things for it to become a reimbursable meal. Otherwise, they're going to be charged um, a la carte prices for anything on their tray. Um, again, you know, again, breakfast is very similar to lunch. Um, I don't deal a lot with kosher meals, but they're in there. Um, standardized recipes, we will just skim through this also. Um, but, but basically it's saying that our recipes should be stand, standardized. They should be consistent throughout the school district. Very challenging because these cooks all think that they have the best method for preparing turkey and gravy. Um, but what this does is this, this helps us analyze um, our our nutritional integrity of our meals. I need to know that they're not adding a half a cup of sodium to their gravy in one building and not in, in another. Um, so this is something we're constantly preaching to our staff. Do not deviate from the recipe. Um, if you do, you need to call and let us know. Is it an ingredient you're missing or what have you? But um, the other of course, the other reason you don't want to deviate from a recipe is that, again, back to food allergies or um, health issues, I seem to be having a lot of diabetic students coming up through um, the younger grades, and I am telling, I may be telling a nurse that there are 40 carbs um, in the meal that this child is going to be eating. If a cook makes a change, um, either adds an extra ingredient or takes something out, that could really change the amount of carbs in a meal. And what that could do is, um, as, as the nurse regulates the insulin pump for this child, um, based on the carb count, I really could be throwing that, that insulin pump out of whack because I've told her some really wrong information. So, again, your directors should really be preaching um, to your cooks to to find a recipe they all can agree on and that works and not deviate from that. And part of the key of that is to have forms, for example, like this one on the screen, um, that any cook can walk into any kitchen in your district and know um, how to read. So it, a menu should not look, or excuse me, a recipe should not look printed one way in one building in a different way in a different building. It really needs to be similar throughout. Um, and the other important piece in the kitchen is production records. Um, production records give us a, really a history of what was produced, what was consumed, and what was left over that day. Um, these are required. These are what the state will use to do a nutritional analysis of your menu. Um, they, will take a, they will take your production records for five days and analyze everything that the children consumed, look at how many meals were offered that day. Um, and from there, uh, they get the breakdown of how much sodium, how many calories, how many, you know, how much vitamin A, how much vitamin C, how much fiber. So these are very, very important. And again, it should be the responsibility of your food service director or manager to um, meet with your cooks every year and make sure that they're comfortable in filling these production records out properly. Um, one, of the, one of the cost benefits to this is that um, we, we tend to run a five-week cycle menu in our district. So as those, distri those five-week cycle menus roll over, 
the kids get familiar with what they're going to be eating. The cooks um, using their production records will get familiar with what to cook. It really does minimize your leftovers. Um, they can look up what, what, how many servings they cooked last time and how many leftovers they had last time they run, ran the same menu. Um, just making it a little bit more of a management tool for them. It does provide a history and will help them in ordering in production. Um, that way, hopefully, you won't have too many leftovers the next time. And this is just an example of, of kind of what a production record would look like. It's got the items, how many you prepared, um, how many were reimbursable, how many of those proportions, how many non-reimbursable portions were sold. That's adult meals. That is second lunches to students and kind of what was left over. Um, there's just an example of one that, that has been filled out. This is kind of, ours are, are front and back every day. We do try to type the information in form to save them a little bit of time. Um, one of the things that the cooks really need to consider when um, filling these out is ounces versus um, volume versus weight. Um, just as an example, you can look at the, the you know, um, grated cheese. Two ounces of grated cheese has 212 calories, but if it's a quarter cup, uh, has only 84 calories. So th they need to make sure that they are um, putting information down correctly on these production records because it can really throw them off. Um, these are just basic instructions on how to fill out production records. Uh, I, I did obtain these from State Ed, and they're very helpful um, if, if your cook managers want to do a little presentation to um, the staff. Um, again, it's it's mandatory that you fill these out. You want to make sure that they're correct. Um, the state ad's going to let you know when they're coming, so you want to make sure you pull a week that looks pretty decent. Um, not a lot of fatty foods, not a lot of high sodium foods. Um, they that is the nice benefit. They do let you pick the week that they will be analyzing the menus. Um, another piece of the program for the food service is that we must have a food safety plan. Um, many of you will have heard this referred to as um, a um, HACCP plan. And a HACCP plan is a hazard analysis critical control point plan, um, meaning that from the minute that truck backs up to the dock to unload food to the, to the very end where the child consumes that food, you must have a plan in place for every step of the way where that food will be touched by human hands. Um, <clears throat> for example, a truck backing into a loading dock, is that truck clean? Is it an improved vendor? Does the vendor have a HACCP plan? Is the truck refrigerated? Are the boxes in good condition? If you open a couple of frozen boxes, is the product frozen? Um, so these are all you know things that should be written in uh, to a plan letting staff know how to handle deliveries, um, how to handle cooking. Is it a one-step process where you're just reheating a product, or is it a two- or three-step process? And where are the critical control points? For example, you know, raw beef. You want to be very careful with cross-contamination. Um, so it, it, it gets pretty detailed, but you must have one of these on file. Um, and it's something that you should be updating and evaluating every year to, uh, as your menus change and the products that you purchase change. Um, there's many websites you can use. Okay. Um, there's many websites you can use to download information to help staff write HACCP plans. Um, and many of the school districts, I'm sure, around you have HACCP plans. They all should. And uh, most people are willing to share what works best for them and what doesn't. So talk to the districts around you. Um, another piece of the puzzle is health inspections. Health inspections are required every year. We are required to send a letter to the health department requesting two inspections per year. Um, we're lucky here in central New York that we don't pay for health inspections. I do believe Monroe County, um, I do believe the schools have to pay for inspections. I could be wrong. Um, so. It's just something, just a little letter that your 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 food service manager should be sending out every year and say August saying, you know, this is XYZ school district. We would 
really love for you to come inspect our facilities twice per year. Um, just again, another one of those little things that State Ed likes to make sure we have on file. Um, another mandatory document that we must keep is a local wellness policy. Uh, I'm sure this has been around for a while now too. I'm sure most of you have worked um, writing your local wellness policy. And this wellness policy really needs to um, dictate how how food is handled really outside of the school lunch program. Um, we have our own rules and regulations, so we aren't part of the actual wellness policy. We They can make suggestions about school lunch in the wellness policy, but, but we really have to follow our own regulations. Um, what this wellness policy is for is more to um, talk about how do you handle vending. Um, do you have rules and regulations for or any policies on, on healthy snacks in the classroom for birthday parties? Um, maybe you have fresh fruit Fridays. And this wellness policy um, is a good place to implement a lot of these changes pushing towards nutritional wellness. Um, I'm, most of you have probably heard or seen this before, but there are foods of non-nutritious or non-nutritious foods uh, that the school is not allowed to sell. Um, school lunch program, I should say, is not allowed to sell things like soda, water, ices, um, ice juices that a lot of the schools use, as long as they're 100% juice, can be used. Um, candies. These are things that should be not included in your school store. Um, with this being said, these products should not be sold during the school day. Um, anytime that school lunch or breakfast program is open, these products should not be sold. I do know there are probably school districts still out there that have um, soda machines for after school. That is actually still allowable. Um, it, you, you just cannot do that during the school day. Um, so watch your school stores. Every once in a while I'll see some strange product in some of the school stores and just have to make sure that they know they can't really be sell selling that product. Um, school stores should also not compete with the school lunch program. If they're going to be selling food, snacks, um, that type thing, and the money is not going to the school lunch program, they should not be open during um, – they can be open before breakfast and after the last lunch has been sold, but they can't really compete with the school lunch program. Um, that kind of goes for vending, too. So if you have athletic departments or student councils that have some kind of vending machines, they're not, in theory, supposed to be competing with the school lunch program. So they really should be put on a timer until the end of the day. Um, doesn't always happen, but most machines these days are pretty smart, and you can put them in, on timers. Um, that goes for the lollipop sales and some of the other stuff that schools do to rate for fundraisers. You're never going to be able to get rid of all of that, but um, just so you know, it's not supposed to take place during the school day. Um, this is just more information about things that can be sold. It's kind of a... Um, I think I think you'll find when it comes to junk food, more and more school food service directors are pushing the student or pushing their staff to offer foods that are a little bit healthier, snacks that are a little bit healthier. At least I hope so. Um, most of us have choose have chosen to keep our snacks to seven grams of fat or less. Try to limit the amount of snacks. Um, just on our own to try to, you know, most of us are pretty proactive in making these programs healthier. Um, this screen is just talking about scheduling times for lunch. There used to be regulations in place that um, you cannot start, there had to be a two-hour window between breakfast and lunch, and that actually was done away with this school year. Uh, it is up to the school district to set their times for breakfast and lunch. Um, they are just saying that basically you really need to schedule enough time for a child to eat. I don't see too many 20-minute lunch periods. Most are 40. I do see some 30-minute lunch periods. And it seems to work. In, in most cases, most students have, have quite a bit of time to eat. Um, I will say that I have seen the schools that put recess before lunch those kids consume much more of the food on their plate. Um, 
doesn't seem to be very easy to do for some reason in scheduling, but it is very beneficial to the students when you schedule recess before lunch. Um, you must have separate prices for adults and students. The adult prices, minimum adult prices are set by state ed every year. You can go on the state ed website in usually August and find what those minimum prices are. And state ed will check when they come and do a CRE review to make sure that you are charging at least the minimum. Um, they will also check to make sure that you are civil um, rights compliant. And what that is is a um, there's a document that you can have your staff read or you can do a little PowerPoint presentation with your staff on civil rights and that we are not going to discriminate against the students who are free, reduced, or paid, staff, um, and, and we must keep on file that we have done that training each year. Um, again, scheduling lunch periods, um, they're just saying that they, these students really need reasonable time to, be, to, to eat, that there's no minimum time anymore. Um, and it, they do, um, they do allow students to not have lunches now. I do have students actually where um, we will pack them a lunch and they will eat in the classroom because it seems more and more students are opting out of actually taking a lunch period. Um, I guess it's the new thing, more and more tests that they have to take. Uh, these are just some of the um, things that we have to keep on file. And again, when it comes to civil rights, there's also a Justice for All poster, which I don't know if you've all seen that, but that is mandatory that that must be displayed next to the cash register. So next time you're in your buildings, make sure that you are um, glancing around by the cash register and you should see a, probably like a 12 by 14 inch poster that says Justice for All at the top. Um, and that should be visible to the students. They tend to get lost over the summer, so um, food service managers should be taking a quick glance to see if they are around. <clears throat> On to monthly claims. Monthly claims are where we make about 50% of our money. 50% um, of our revenue comes in from the sale of, of breakfast and lunch, and um, a majority of the other money would be coming in from um, a la carte sales. Uh, some districts still do quite a bit of catering. Uh, it depends on the district itself. So you may, you know, um, you may find 15 to 20 percent of your revenue still coming in from catering. Um, just depends on on each district. But submitting monthly claims is is very important, and it's so important to make sure again that we're accounting for the meals accurately. Um, so you just want to glance through your reports before you file a claim. But I do try to do my claims as quickly as I can after the end of the month. Um, federal government is very good about paying quickly. I like to have that money sitting in my account as soon as I can. State, as you all know, um, sometimes takes two or three months to pay us. So um, I'd rather get those claims put in right away. So hopefully towards the end of the year it will all kind of balance out and they'll get those final payments in there. Um, but things you need for the claim are your total meal served. You need to know your um, enrollment figures for the month, and you need to know how many free and reduced eligible students you have um, on file, meaning how many free and reduced applications you have on file. You also then need to know how many days, um, how many days of service there were during that month, so that you can fill out all the paperwork. Um, on to fund balances. Fund balances, um, I don't know, you're only allowed to carry three months of your operating expenses um, at any given time. On occasion, they'll let you slide with four here and there, but really, um, if you have more than three months operating expenses, you need to be spending that money down or the state will take it. Um, and you need to be spending that money on food service related items. Um, you, now you can get a little creative. Um, you know, it may be a truck that you 
use, um, maybe you need a truck to transport food from school to school. Maybe you'll need that truck 90% of the time. You probably can let maintenance borrow it here and there. Um, but it really needs to be something that is, is primarily geared towards your program. Uh, there are districts out there that see a big fund balance and they start thinking that they, we can pay for all sorts of maintenance uh, equipment and um, maybe a couple of custodians. You just need to get very, be very careful because if that custodian is not dedicated to the food service program or spends most of their time cleaning the cafeterias, um, tables, what have you, then state ed could frown upon that. Um, now, they will, they will let you bank more than three months of, of fund balance if you are planning a major um, renovation. But most major renovations really do fall under building projects. Um, now and then, the, the kitchen may have to do it on their own. Um, but I, I will say, you know, this, this slide is telling you one month's operating cost. I tend to keep a little more than that. A dishwasher alone, a medium-sized dishwasher, you can be looking at twelve to fifteen thousand um, dollars. And that, that, you know, some of those smaller school districts, that's a, that's a month right there. So I tend to keep closer to two to three months' operating costs, if po at all possible. Of course, there are districts where, you know. Equipment breaks constantly, so it's not always that easy. Um, there are there there's certain things that we are allowed to pay for, th certain things we're not allowed to pay for, um, and, and there are direct and indirect costs. Um, um, and indirect costs can be things such as lighting and heating, and, and most school districts do not charge the food service program for these costs. Um, however, um, things can be negotiated. Um, one of the other things we really can't spend our, our, our excess money on if we have any excess funds is um, a lot of structural things. Um, and it, you would have to get pre-approval from state ed, but a lot of plumbing issues, new flooring, uh, they're pretty specific about not spending it on building itself. These have to be removable pieces of equipment, so uh, it can be brought to another kitchen. But I'm sure in composing a nice letter to state ed, they might allow you to do that. Um, general fund costs covered by indirect cost rates, um, utilities, auditor, auditor expenses, um, Benefits for retired cafeteria employees. Let's go. Um, oh, that was it on that. Okay. Um, school administrator expenses, including office expenses, central printing and mailing expenses. Um, and, and these are all recovered by indirect cost rate. Um, snacks in the after school care program. You can have a snack program. There are many schools out there that do have a snack program. Um, it, it, and it can be very beneficial. I think more and more schools are finding that kids are having to stay after school for, um, you know, an eighth, ninth, tenth period, whatever, however many periods you have um, for study purposes to keep these kids caught up. And so many schools do offer us in a snack program. Um, it is treated the same. This basically the same way as the school lunch or school breakfast program. There are components. Um, we have to make sure the kids have all the components on their tray. They need to, be, their names need to be checked off on a roster, um, and we fill out a claim as we would for um, breakfast and lunch. So it's very similar. The funding is not, um, the reimbursement rates are not as large as they are for breakfast or lunch. So you have to be very careful when planning a snack menu that you are really using your government commodity foods. Um, just going into snack times and what's what you're allowed, what's not. Um, you must do self-reviews during the year, one snack per child per day, very similar again to the lunch program. Um, um, these are just there are different rates for um, snacks. Full price students may be charged whatever price we determine. Um, 
reduced price students are not charged more than 15 cents, where at lunchtime it's a 25 cent charge. Um, and free students are always categorically free, of course. Um, this just goes into the snack components. Um, these are the reimbursement rates, uh, which are a little bit different than lunchtime. Um, lunchtime, depending on if you're severe need, uh, are right up around two dollars and seventy-six cents for a free meal. So you can see the difference. Um, again, we have to keep all of our documentation on file. Um, if it's a program run within the school district, we can be using our own free and reduced information. And um, you know, it is very beneficial to those kids that again may not be um, may have to stay after school and may not really be getting snacks at, when they get home. Um, so that would be something that to talk to your food service director, or food service manager about uh, if you have any interest in doing that. It's not hard to get a program up and running at all. Um, a CREE review, again, is when they monitor um, our frame reduced applications, make sure we're, we're um, claiming the right number of meals. Um, they will choose, they will come, again, it's changing to every three years, um, and they will review a different number of buildings depending on how many buildings you have in your district. Um, and you know, it's just the process that you'll go through. They'll, they'll enter, do an um, entrance conference, um, write you up if they find that they need to, and you need to come up with a corrective action plan. Um, and they will follow up with you. Um, and hopefully, um, they never find any anything that's so in, so intolerable that they, you have to have some kind of a financial action where they could be taking. Um, funds away from you. Um, for example, I do believe this hasn't changed, but if they find a mistake in an application, say a child was uh, reduced and should have been paid, they will go back and monitor how many meals were, were um, fed to that student for whatever time period they find the mistake for. Um, and if it's if it's over six hundred dollars, uh, the mistake, if it if it benefited you in over $600 in reimbursement, um, they will take that money back. If it's $600 or less in, in um, financial um, mistakes, then they will not um, have you pay uh, that money back to state ed. So $600 at this point seems to be the threshold for correcting mistakes. Um, but there are performance standards. Uh, and I see we're starting to get a little low on time. So um, this is all basic stuff you can read through um, about what they're looking for in these CREE reviews. Um, of course, you don't want any violations ever. I find that state ed is very helpful. I'm probably on the phone with them at least once a week asking stupid questions about free and reduced applications. I'd rather have them um, to their liking than um, to not do them right. They're always very helpful. Um, again, they're going to check your verification process. Um, make sure you've you've trained um, your staff in civil service that your records are all correct. That you um, you you're doing your self monitoring, meaning that we do a self evaluation of each building each year. They're going to look those over. Um, they're they're going to want to see student and parent involvement, and I find a good way to 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 um, involve um, parents in discussions is through the wellness policy. If you can get a parent or two on board, um, that that helps and it starts the communication uh, process. Uh, PTOs are great if you can attend a PTO meeting or two per year. Um, we often find that it's an extra avenue for us to make money. If we can make friends with um, the PTO, they do a lot of um, events where they need food, why not buy it through us for a minimal markup? It's still going to be cheaper than probably buying items off the street. Um, say we make 10% off the deal. Um, There's a nice little avenue for just making money and helping the PTO out. Um, <clears throat> this is just a checklist to make sure um, that we are compliant for this year. Um, some of the things that have changed, um, 
It, you see a category on here called water. It is now mandatory that students have access to water at lunchtime. Uh, whether this means you have water fountains inside your cafeteria or a reasonable distance to the cafeteria outside the cafeteria. Um, some of the schools we did buy um, water containers, kind of like the sports drink containers, but you must have a access for, for children to um, have water with lunch if they want it. And this could mean that you are now paying for cups that you never planned on paying for, and over the course of the year that can add up to hundreds of dollars. Um, so you need to watch your cup usage and make sure that that they're not being wasted. Um, our SMI is our nutritional review. This is uh, where a dietitian from State Ed will come in and review our production records, which we talked about earlier, um, and they they will make sure that we are meeting the required um, components that we're providing enough calories. Uh, that there's enough fiber, that we're reducing sodium, that, we're meet, that we are following the correct meal patterns. Um, again, they're very helpful. Um, they require us to provide labels for every product that um, we've served in that five-day period that we are going to choose. Um, and that's another mandatory thing, and it's very helpful, again, for the nurses, is um, you, it is mandatory for the food service department to keep on file a label, a, a book of all of the labels or products that they use. Um, and, and it's hard to do because each year, you, you know, due to the bid process, you may have different vendors in there. And we kind of have what we call a label party at the beginning of each school year, and um, we'll assign a kitchen to a product. For example, the high school may be meats and proteins. Uh, the middle school may be fruits and vegetables. You know, another school may be snacks. Um, and we just, everything that they serve over the course of a two or three week period, we just have them collect as many labels as they possibly can and uh, ship them up to the food service office and we update our books each year that way. Uh, a lot more of the vendors are becoming um, helpful in this process. A lot of them you can actually log into their systems now and they will provide you with labels if you're missing a label um, or you can look something up before you go to purchase that product. Again, with the allergies becoming such an issue, you may want to look and see if something has red dye. Um, so it's very helpful. Um, you know, this is just talking about corrective actions if, if they find that you're not in compliance. And to date, the SMI, um, which is your school meal initiative, which is your, your nutritional piece of the review, they have never cited anybody financially for not meeting their standards. Um, I think most school districts are kind of hovering around what they, um, they're kind of hovering around what state ed feels they need to be at but there aren't too many school districts that met or exceeded in every category. Um, but everybody's getting there. Um, in terms of finances, um, I've, obviously you all know that we have to have a budget in place and um, really important for us to review and, and, and get a, a nice strong budget together um, as a target for us to follow for the year. Um, Every school district is set up differently, but a majority of us food service directors do create our own monthly profit and loss statement now. Um, and I think working in, in conjunction with your business official to come up with a, a nice, easy, understandable profit and loss um, spreadsheet is, is your best um, way to go about this. Um, years ago when I first started, most of the school districts were not taking monthly inventories. But I think over the years with the auditors really pushing um, for to monitor theft in, in um, effective cost procedures, I think just about every school district now takes monthly inventories. And this again will help with your profit and loss. Um, and because we follow those five week cycle menus, our, we kind of, it helps control our monthly inventories. Um, and it helps me with ordering. I will pull inventories at the end of the month and see you know, for way out of whack on a certain product or two, I may change the menu because I can see that obviously the kids aren't purchasing, you know, scalloped potatoes or, or what have you. 
Um, but it does it does help to to glance the, over those. Um, we also like to pre-cost our menus, um, and that just that just helps me to know that um, there are certain days that I may have really expensive menus, but I know my production or, or my participation rates are going to go through the roof. So um, every once in a while, you know, even though we pre-cost our menus, I may have one or two very high price points for an item or two, but uh, this kind of gives me an idea of what I'm going to spend per month if a student were to eat every day of the week. Um, just making sure I'm not going crazy with my food costs. Um, Cost-effective purchasing. Most school districts these days belong to some sort of a bid group. And this is a good way to keep your, um, to be cost-effective. If you're a small school district and you're out there sending out your own bids, in a comp and you're not near any major cities, you're going to struggle in getting vendors to come out to you. If you're part of a big BOCES purchasing group or um, even just three or four school districts that get together and come up with their own group, um, it just gives you more buying power, more leverage, um, and you may, if you know, if you're a big enough group, be able to talk these vendors into bringing in products that they're not normally going to carry. Um, but can be beneficial to you. And of course, one of the, the most important things you can do is to go out and visit the sites as frequently as you can. Um, I often find myself ending up subbing <laughs> as usually working in the dish room um, because some they're just so short and uh, just need a little bit of help. But you know what? I learn more in that half an hour, 45 minutes, to an hour, hour and a half, whatever I'm in that kitchen, I learn more about what I need to do, what needs to be corrected, than I could in a week or two of just having meetings with food service staff. You really get to see what's going on, what's not working, what's working, where money's being wasted, um, where where they're doing a very good job, and um, very important, very important to do. Um, so, you know, this will just go into the value of a budget. I think most of us know how important a budget is, how we need to really evaluate, um, you know, with our profit and loss in our budget, we can see where we're bleeding money, where we're really taking money in. Um, and that leads us to labor costs. Hmm. Labor costs can be the most expensive thing we have to face. Um, these days, a lot of our school contracts still say that any employee that works four or more hours is eligible for health benefits, and we all know that the cost of health benefits are are going through the roof. Um, and a small program like the food service program cannot really be offering all staff um, health benefits. So as people retire, um, it's very important to look at um, can that job be split into two different jobs? Can you have somebody come in in the morning and somebody come in in the afternoon? You know, that can save you upwards of $15,000 a year. Um, there are a lot of school districts out there that are um, actually starting to rewrite the contracts. Um, so it may say six or more hours, uh, and then they'll be offered health benefits. Uh, I would rather take, I would rather have, you know, three or four employees for that one financially. Um, it makes more sense to me financially. Um, but it, it's not always going to be the best option. Um, you know, if your contract says six hours, you may need to have one or two people in a kitchen that do have health benefits. Um, it is what it is. Uh, again, I think your your best bet is to slowly negotiate these contracts um, and see if you can get them to increase them to five and maybe six hours per day. Um, productivity rates. This is a nice little tool for determining your meals per labor hour. And basically what that means is, is how productive is your kitchen? Um, are they producing... 12 meals per labor hour, or are they producing 18 meals per labor hour? And um, basically, this little screen here, if anybody you know wants it in the future, I have a little spreadsheet that um, has a nice little formula in it, which basically is, is, is 
this meal equivalent conversion um, sheet, but th this takes into account your total labor, labor hours in the kitchen, um, how many lunches you serve, that's one a meal equivalent, how many dollars in a la carte sales, um, and for every three dollars that you sell, they, they feel that that's worth one meal, so one meal equivalent, and for every three breakfasts that you serve, that will be one meal equivalent, and you, you divide that out to figure out you know, your total labor hours and your total meal equivalents. And you're really shooting for, you know, they have 16 on the screen there. 16 is a pretty decent number. Um, if you're 12 or under, your kitchen really not being as productive as it could be. So that might mean that, hey, maybe you're overstaffed or you need to find more ways to increase school lunch um, sales or a la carte sales to get that productivity back up there. Um, and this is here's basically like my formula if anybody wants it down the road. Um, just giving you an idea of um, how to, how it breaks it down and determines productivity rates. Um, and here are just a few ways to control labor costs. Um, you know, full-time staff with benefits, again, we, we touched on that. Re-look re at your labor contracts. Um, Staff development, you know, somebody may be good in more than one aspect of the job. Maybe you can use staff development to train them in two different aspects of the job. If they're already receiving benefits, maybe they can do more for you. Um, and why not give that five-hour person that has benefits an eight-hour day uh, might be cheaper than hiring two five-hour employees. <clears throat> and, of course, work harder, not smarter. <laughs> We've all heard that. Um, find ways to make your staff more productive. Um, again, going into food cost, it's it's very good idea to pre-cost your menu. You want to make sure you're you're not serving something that won't, at the end of the day, uh, with your reimbursement um, rates coming back in, you want to make sure that those reimbursement rates cover the cost of that food, cover the cost of your labor. So you don't want to have um, anything too expensive on your menu. Um, portion control charts. Portion control is very important. Uh, that's part of what those production records help us do is um, standardize recipes, let them know how much um, a recipe should produce. The production records tell them, okay, you got X amount of servings out of that recipe. Um, where'd you go wrong? Or maybe everything was working just right. Um, commodities, government commodities, which we receive every month, are very important to us, uh, but they're not free. Um, there are hidden costs in commodities. We have to pay warehousing charges. We have to pay charges to get the product back to the warehouse or from the warehouse to our schools. Um, and some people do um, direct diversion, so we take those commodities and turn them into products that kids may want. Um, and portion control, again, we just touched briefly on that, but here's a little example of the difference just a few, you know, a slight change might make in a half ounce of turkey. You know, you're looking at five cents there, difference, five cents times 10,000 meals, that gets pretty pricey over the course of a year. So, um, again, standardized recipe, portion control, um, very important. And, again, offer versus serve, which we touched on. Um, you want to offer it to them. You don't want to just force them to take it because uh, if they're going to throw it away, it's not doing you any good. Um, Monthly profit and loss. Again, um, make sure it's something easy to understand. It doesn't have to be as complicated um, as, as um, you know, some of the things a business official might do. Just your revenues, your expenses, um, your inventories should be in there um, just to track your inventories. Um, and it, it really can, you know, most food service programs, we tend to see a loss in the beginning, the first few months of school, because we have so many expenses. At the beginning of school, um, refilling our warehouses, our, our kitchens, um, buying chemical. So you, we usually start to see a turnaround in finances in maybe January or February. Um, hopefully that's where most programs start to break even and, and run into the black for the year. Um, doesn't always work that way, but that's, that's basically the typical pattern I see in the eight districts I have here. Um, really struggling those first few months of the winter. And then um, as January hits, January is a big, long month. It helps us make some money. Um, December and November are financial killers because I've got holidays to pay for staff, and they're very short months, so we're not claiming many meals. Um, 
It's just talking about balancing expenses with revenues, which you can go into more detail. Um, inventories, again, it's important to take inventory. Um, physical inventory versus perpetual. I have more and more auditors pushing me to take perpetual inventories, but it's very time consuming and I don't really have the, my staff are stretched so thin um, that I'm still fighting and trying to just take physical inventories at the end of the month. Uh, with that being said, we keep our inventories pretty low so we can detect theft pretty quickly. Um, just some basic ways to in increase revenue. Make sure that we're reaching all of our free and reduced students, population, catering, uh, expanding a la carte hours to maybe after school, uh, right before sports start, uh, maybe vending, increasing your vending. Um, evaluate a la carte prices. You really should be at least doubling the price of a product, if, if not more. Um, you know, again, make sure that we're reaching a free and reduced um, families. This new direct certification process should really be helping that. Um, you need to make sure that, um, you know, schools that have high free and reduced rates don't want to, they want to be feeding those, those children reimbursable meals. Schools that have low free and reduced rates may want to look at um, a la carte meals versus reimbursable. Does it make more sense to offer some gourmet foods if, if the kids have a lot of pocket change um, versus a reimbursable meal? Where, where are you going to make more money? Uh, are you going to make more money um, for a meal where you're receiving uh, paid reimbursement funds back? Or is it better to sell a $2.50 salad um, to a student? Just some things to think about. You really need to kind of play with your menus and your math when looking at that. Um, well, and that's that, and it is three twenty nine. Um, again, I will just touch briefly on allergies. You do want to start to have some kind of food allergy plan. Um, it doesn't hurt to maybe talk to a dietitian. Um, we are in the process of putting together an allergy booklet, how to handle allergies in each kitchen. We're coming up with allergy boards, what to look for in certain foods so that it's easily identifiable by the kitchen staff. Um, and of course, peanut allergies are kind of the biggest and have been around the longest. You really want to meet with your nursing staff and know that you have a detailed plan in place for how to handle an emergency, how to handle that kid's menu on a daily basis, um, and you do want heavy parent involvement. I think parents feel better when they're involved in, in developing these plans. They're, they're the ones that live with it every day. We aren't, so um, why not get their input? Um, but this is a growing problem that will not go away, and I'm sure sooner or later we're going to have to, it's going to be mandatory that we have some kind of a, a legal plan in place, so we might as well start one now. Um, I guess that's it, unless anybody has any questions. All right, if anyone has any questions, please hit 7 pound on your phone, and then I'll put you right through to Wendy, or you can just go ahead and type it in on the uh, chat screen to the right. Okay, last chance. If anyone has any questions, please hit seven pound on your phone. All right, Wendy, no one has any questions. So thank you very much for presenting today. You did a great job. And everyone, thank you very much for coming today. Um, if you are part of the online course, next Monday the 21st, we have the transportation of your pupils, and I should be in contact very soon about rescheduling the uh, understanding supervisory management um, and responsibilities. So thank you very much, and everyone have a great week. Wendy, thank you again. Thank you. The moderator has ended the conference. Goodbye. Thank you for calling.